very, very warm welcome to you. We hope that you'll get some coffee and refreshment to help you get started today. And if the staff can help you in any way, be sure to ask. Uh, it would be entirely appropriate to commence by expressing our thanks to the French National Library, which through the years has provided such uh, excellent staff work and so much support for the conferences. The uh, library, of course, um, is one of the great world treasures, and it's a great honor for us to be able to assemble here as we do. We also want to thank uh, the many, many uh, French institutions, the Grand Lodges, that uh, are so hospitable. Uh, truly, Mer Paris is the Masonic capital of the world, uh, and it carries us off with great aplomb and great style uh, and great panache. Uh, people love to come here, understandably, and we are very grateful to all who make this so easy and so possible. I'd like to call your attention uh, to the need to publish papers arising out of this conference, either in the journal, which Pierre Moliere is the editor of, or in the book series from Westphalia Press. Don't let your manuscripts languish. Uh, we are ready and able to publish them so that the greater scholarly community knows about your work and knows what you are doing. Uh, it's a job that we do with great relish and, and we want to work with you in publishing your scholarship and your research. A few little notes. There are several cafes in the library building. Uh, and uh, outside of the library, there are a number of restaurants and cafes. Uh, the uh, library also has uh, a very beautiful garden, which it surrounds. Uh, and it has many exhibits that are worthwhile. It's, uh, a remarkable place. Well, having thanked you for coming and thanked the library for hosting, I'll now uh, turn this over to my co-president. Bonjour, good morning. My name is Guillermo de los Reyes. A pleasure to be here for the third time after a few years ago that we started the conference. Uh, merci beaucoup to la, the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, to Pierre Molière, uh, our colleague who has been really pivotal for this conference. Uh, today we start the discussion about the story, uh, the story of Freemasonry from different pers perspectives. We will begin with um, an amazing lecture by uh, Professor uh, Pr uh, Andrew Prescott, and we will continue the works this afternoon and tomorrow. We hope that, um, first of all, also, I mean, second of all, I would like to thank you, the people who were here in the previous conferences, who are regular presenters here. Thank you very much. And uh, also, we would like to invite you to continue coming to our f future conferences in Washington, D.C., next year, 2020, and in here in Paris in 2021. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, mentioned the importance to the study of Freemasonry from a, from a scholarly perspective, uh, bringing to the forge the archives, the, re the, doc the support of the claims that we, that we try to make in our quest to know more about Freemasonry. Merci beaucoup, and now my, our colleague, 
and host Pierre Molière. S'il vous plaît. Merci, Pierre. Bien, eh bien, écoutez, nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir pour cette troisième conférence internationale d'histoire de la franc-maçonnerie et des mouvements fraternels à Paris. Alors, c'est la troisième à Paris, mais le, les, les premières conférences ont eu lieu à Édimbourg et euh, trois conférences sont organisées à Édimbourg. Et puis, finalement, l'organisation était un peu lourde. La personne qui s'en occupait euh, n'était moins disponible et euh, ce, projet ne, ce, ce projet semblait s'arrêter. Et grâce à nos amis de PSO et notamment à Paul, enfin surtout à Paul, euh, il y a eu cette idée de, de continuer cette, euh, cette idée vraiment étonnante de, de rassembler des chercheurs euh, d'histoire maçonnique un peu partout dans le monde. Et euh, ça a été possible à la Bibliothèque nationale à Paris. Alors à Paris, parce qu'en France, il y a une recherche maçonnique assez active et à la Bibliothèque nationale, parce que depuis quelques années, la Bibliothèque nationale est un lieu euh, qui euh, accueille des manifestations autour de l'histoire maçonnique. Alors la raison à ça, c'est qu'elle a un magnifique fonds maçonnique, hein, plus d'un kilomètre d'archives, de manuscrits euh, qui constituent d'ailleurs un, un, un fonds au sein du département des manuscrits et qui est un des fonds les plus importants avec un kilomètre. Et euh, c'est vrai que euh, il faut, beaucoup d'entre nous travaillent sur ce fond et en 2016, nous, ça avait été un peu le prétexte de cette exposition sur la franc-maçonnerie autour duquel s'étaient organisées nos, nos premières rencontres. Alors c'est l'occasion aussi de remercier une fois de plus Sylvie Bourrel qui est la conservatrice de ce fonds maçonnique et de présenter ses excuses. Elle aurait souhaité être parmi nous aujourd'hui mais elle a des contraintes familiales assez fortes qui font qu'elle n'a elle n'a pas pu être parmi nous, mais euh, tous les chercheurs ici savent euh, combien nous avons bon accueil et combien euh, euh, nous pouvons travailler dans des conditions extraordinaires sur ces, sur ces archives et sur ce fond. Donc voilà, alors cette troisième conférence, chaque conférence a un peu un thème. Cette troisième conférence, elle est euh, notamment centrée sur la question des grades écossais et du rite écossais. Euh, et... Elle est, alors je ne sais pas si c'est le lancement, mais c'est un des lieux où on présente le nouveau livre de Brent Morris, qui est un des grands historiens du rite écossais. Et euh, donc, euh, voilà, ça va être un temps fort pour l'histoire du rite écossais, ces deux jours. Mais euh, le rite écossais est un peu comme la nouvelle histoire. Il considère que euh, beaucoup de choses sont, sont liées à lui. Et donc, on traitera aussi d'autres sujets, de Cagliostro, euh, de, de l'histoire de la maçonnerie en Italie. Enfin, vous avez ce programme très très dense et qui se tiendra dans le grand auditorium et euh, dans le petit auditorium qui est un peu plus loin euh, au cours de ces deux jours. Donc voilà, merci à la Bibliothèque nationale de nous accueillir et euh, ça marque euh, euh, son importance dans la maçonnerie, non pas parce qu'elle est constituée de quatre équerres, comme pourraient euh, penser certains ésotéristes, hein, les quatre tours sont quatre équerres, euh, mais parce qu'elle a accueilli depuis quelques années beaucoup de manifestations autour de l'étude académique de la franc-maçonnerie. Um, in the last few years, uh, An Andrew Prescott has um, attracted more attention than he usually attracts, not to say he isn't very well known as a scholar, but he chose to uh, go into the battle over uh, some things that um, stirred people and still stir people and upset people. That is to say, the origins of the Grand Lodge of England. It seems that he has uh, conclusively, I think from many people's point of view, proved his point, but uh, he continues to be uh, a, a source of uh, great discussion because of his contributions to the 18th century historical analysis of Freemasonry. And so it is a great privilege uh, to have him keynote today. Andrew? Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, malheureusement, uh, mon présentation est en anglais. Um, uh, je peux lire et comprendre français bien, mais pour parler français, pour moi, c'est une catastrophe. It's an insult to the French nation. Um, et, mais uh, <laughs> uh, uh, je peux, uh, uh, j'aime bien uh, la langue française uh, et, 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 et c'est un douleur uh, que mon présentation est en anglais. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for the very warm welcome and for your energy and initiative and those of your colleagues in organizing this excellent conference. I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to return uh, to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. I was actually one of the curators from the British Library who brought uh, material for the exhibition uh, when the library was inaugurated, I think it's now tw nearly 25 years ago, whether that's anything to do with the cafe I noticed on the way here called the British Library and Frog, I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, be back here. Uh, and thank you to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France for its hospitality. Among the most famous and remarkable French historians was Marc Bloch, one of the founders of the Annales School which pioneered the use of sociological, anthropological, and comparative techniques in the study of history. After the fall of Vichy, France in 1942, Bloch joined the French resistance. He was captured in Lyon in 1944 and handed over to Klaus Barbie, the head of the Lyon Gestapo. During his imprisonment, Bloch was beaten and tortured. Following the D-Day invasion, the Nazis were anxious to dispose of French prisoners, and on the 6th of June, 1944, 75 years ago, Marc Bloch was executed by firing squad. Among the works by Bloch, which were published after his death, was The Historian's Craft, a series of reflection, reflections on the historian's method. Ever since his appearance in 1949, the historian's craft has profoundly influenced the way historians think about what they do and how they approach both the past and the present. Among the most celebrated chapters in this short book is one entitled The Idol of Origins, in which Bloch suggests that the besetting sin of historians is an obsession with origins. Bloch cites Renan, who declared, in all human affairs, it's the origins which deserve study before everything else. Bloch reminds us how frequently books appear with titles like The Origins of Contemporary France, The Origins of the Reformation, or The Origins of the French Revolution. There's an often an ambiguity about the way in which historians use the term origins. Sometimes they use it as a shorthand for the beginnings of a particular phenomenon. On other occasions, they use origins to mean causes. The danger is when the two become conflated, when we assume that we think we can understand historical events by tracing their beginnings. Simply identifying how something began does not explain how it developed. If we think about the history of Christianity, whether or not Christ was crucified and resurrected is not a very interesting question. What happened to Christ is almost an irrelevance to the history of Christianity. For the historian, the pressing question is rather what social, political, and cultural conditions caused millions of people to believe that Christ came back from the dead why these beliefs led to wholesale slaughter and invasion, and why they still persist. For Mark Bloch, the obsession with finding the point of origin bleeds the life from history and distracts us from exploring how society shifts and changes. Religious belief is an example of a historical phenomenon whose study is distorted by an obsession with origins. Religion is like a knot that ties together many different aspects of society. If we only look for the point of origin of religious institutions, we ignore the way they bind together many social and human interconnections. This applies not only to religion, but to all human institutions, including Freemasonry. Freemasonry is a good illustration of the debilitating effects of the idol of origins. Freemasons have been obsessed for centuries with seeking the truth about where Freemasonry came from. 
The medieval charges have been obsessively classified and categorized to the point where it is sometimes not entirely clear what the different manuscripts say. These stonemason's documents are precious evidence of artisan organization in the British Isles, but because of the mania for trying to reconstruct the earliest form of text, many of these charges have never been properly edited, and we aren't even sure where some of the most important manuscripts actually are. Instead of using these documents to understand how stonemasons were organized and what beliefs bound them together, researchers have spent more than a century engaged in a fruitless and enervating search for the origin of the texts in the hope that this will help find the origin of Freemasonry. In our search for the smoking gun which might reveal the origin of Freemasonry, we constantly ignore the wider picture. The National Archives in London contain over 200 wills of men from different parts of England who died in the 16th and 17th centuries and described themselves as Freemasons. There are hundreds more such wills elsewhere. Obsessed with seeking the point of origin, nobody has ever studied these wills which cast light on the economic and social conditions of stonemasons in the period establishing the, the establishment of Grand Lodge and thereby help us to understand better the significance of the creation of Grand Lodge. The idol of origins saps our understanding of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is particularly prone to the worship of that idol of origins. Freemasonry claims to preserve ancient landmarks of ritual and wisdom. It claims to be the incarnation of pure ancient masonry. It's natural to ask where this pure ancient masonry comes from and what it represents. The rituals impart ancient secrets, which purport to have been handed down through generations of stonemasons. We inevitably wonder where these ancient secrets come from and what their beginnings were. This search is made more febrile by the conviction that Freemasonry hands down a hidden secret. Freemasons from James Anderson to Chevalier Ramsey, William Preston and George Oliver have fruitlessly used many different methods to try and discover this secret. And perhaps every Masonic researcher is driven by the inner belief that somehow they will show what it all is about. What's it about? They'll show us. The idol of origins means Masonic researchers too often prefer to speculate on the findings of previous researchers rather than go in search of new evidence. Pontification serves the need of the idol of origins more readily than primary sources. The idol of origins is not only about a misplaced belief that finding the beginning will explain everything. It's also about power. Power, of course, permeates history. But expressions of power go beyond politics, diplomacy, and war. Cultural power can be the most oppressive and destructive of all. Myths of origin are an important weapon of cultural power. They keep nations together and monarchs on their thrones. Mark Bloch pointed out how history concerned with origins is frequently invoked to support value judgments. As he put it, whether the subject is the Germanic invasions of the Roman Empire or the Norman conquest of England, the past is used as an explanation of the present in order that the present might be better justified or condemned. The search for origins is a means of developing histories which reinforce existing power structures in society. Many things that we think of as age-old traditions are recent inventions, frequently invented in order to bolster nationalism. A famous collection of essays edited by Eric Hobsbawm and Trevor Aston is called The Invention of Tradition. This book argues that many of the traditions thought to characterize the British nation are of very recent origin 
and were often deliberately manufactured. The British enthusiasm for royal ceremony was an imperial creation of the early 20th century, while many aspects of the Scottish Highland tradition date back no further than the beginning of the 19th century. The Welsh Druid ceremonies associated with the Eisteddfod were invented by the opium addict Yolo Magonog in the early 19th century as a means of protecting the Welsh language in an increasingly industrialised society. In his introduction, Hobsbawm points out that this process of inventing tradition gained considerable momentum during the period between 1850 and the First World War and suggests that it is linked to the growth of modern ideas of the nation. As Hobsbawm put it, invented traditions are, quote, highly relevant to that comparatively recent historical innovation, the nation, with its associated phenomena, nationalism, the nation state, national symbols, histories, and the rest. All these depend on exercises, exercises in social engineering, which are often deliberate and always innovative. The invention of tradition is a vital political weapon, and myths of national origin continue to be invented today by populist politicians across the world, from Erdogan in Turkey and Viktor Orban in Hungary to Narendra Modi in India. Hobsbawm summarizes the power of this ability to create and manipulate tradition as follows. History is the raw material for nationalist or ethnic or fundamentalist ideologies, as poppies are the raw material for heroin addiction. The past is an essential element, perhaps the essential element in these ideologies. If there is no suitable past, it can always be invented. Indeed, in the nature of things, there usually is no entirely suitable past because the phenomenon these ideologies claim to justify is not ancient or eternal, but historically novel. Freemasonry is particularly prone to the crack cocaine of nationalization. Whether it is in promoting the myth of George Washington in the United States, seeking to preserve the spirit of the French Revolution in Paris, or toasting the Queen in London. In reading my title today, you may have thought I was going to prostrate myself before the idol of origins and reveal sensational new evidence about where Freemasonry comes from. I will not be doing that. Instead, I want to discuss how myths of the origin of Freemasonry have been manipulated as a means of power play in Freemasonry. I want to illustrate how master narratives have been invented by different Masonic bodies and individuals in an attempt to bolster their own power and influence. I want to try and convince you, as researchers into Freemasonry, that you should think less about where Freemasonry came from and more about the way in which it has been constantly reinvented and reimagined to suit different social, cultural, and political agendas. Modern Freemasonry is the result of a complex process of historical change which began at least in the middle of the 14th century. In each century thereafter, Freemasonry changed profoundly and was used for different social and cultural ends. As Freemasonry developed, different stories were invented to justify its appropriation by a variety of elite groups in different countries. Our job is not to try and trace a false point of origin for Freemasonry, but rather to look at the way in which these master narratives were invented and how they were used. As historians, we can never hope to find out what actually happens, and indeed what actually happens isn't very interesting often. Actually, what we can find out is what people pretended happened, what they said happened, and it's the different way in which people claim or invent narratives of what happened, which is the really interesting question for the historian. The most striking illustration of the invention of Masonic tradition are the stories around the creation of a Grand Lodge in London in the early 18th century. 
The Grand Lodge in London has consistently, over 300 years, manipulated and reinvented historical tradition to bolster its own prestige and power. Its authority depends on historical inventions. But of course, the United Grand Lodge of England is not unusual in the way it manipulates history for political ends. A foundation myth is one of the distinguishing features of a fraternal organization. The website of the Odd Fellows traces the origin of the order to 587 BC and states that the earliest legend of an Odd Fellows fraternity is linked to the ex exile of the Israelites in Babylon when many banded together into a brotherhood for mutual support. Similarly, the Druid friendly societies claim to be directly descended from the Druids of pre Roman Britain. We should not simply ignore such stories as rubbish. One of the most important roles of the historian is to examine how these stories were invented and the ways in which they were used for political purposes. The United Grand Lodge of England has recently celebrated 300 years of Freemasonry. The way in which these celebrations were marketed is an example of the type of slippery terminology that, as Mark Bloch noticed, often muddies discussions of origins. The implication of the UGLE strapline, 300 years of Freemasonry, is that Freemasonry began in 1717. But of course, even the United Grand Lodge of England couldn't claim that. The strange dramatization that was included in the Royal Albert Hall celebrations refers to the initiation of Elias Ashmole in 1646 and Sir Robert Moray at Newcastle in 1641 without mentioning that Moray's initiation was by members of the Lodge of Edinburgh. The implication of that UGLE strapline is that the Grand Lodge is equivalent to Freemasonry and that 300 years of Grand Lodge equals 300 years of Freemasonry. But is a Grand Lodge all that Freemasonry consists of? The creation of the Grand Lodge was, after all, simply an administrative device whereby the London Lodges gave up their right in trust to a representative assembly comprising masters and wardens and governed by Grand Officers. Although the creation of the London Grand Lodge certainly marked a profound change and upsurge in Freemasonry, is it right to suggest that a Grand Lodge is the essential feature of Freemasonry? This claim to 300 years of Freemasonry may also be seen as a veiled allusion to the emergence of a three-degree system, but most authorities place the appearance of a third degree as, again, a later development, perhaps during the 1720s. Most of the other distinctive features of Freemasonry, lodges on a territorial basis, the admission of members who weren't working stonemasons, use of ritual, the Mason word, can be found much earlier than 1717, particularly in Scotland. It isn't clear why the Enlightenment form of Freemasonry, which developed in the 18th century, is considered a purer form of masonry than that practiced in Scotland, Ireland, and England in the 17th century. Why were we not celebrating 400 or even 700 years of Freemasonry in 2017? The United Grand Lodge of England was invoking and manipulating the past to bolster its claim to Masonic primacy and to be an arbiter of regularity across the world. Freemasonry has invoked the past since its inception. The two oldest surviving manuscripts describing the legendary Masonic history, the Cook Manuscript and the Regius Manuscript, both in the British Library in London, date from the early 15th century. Comparison of these texts show how they are independent compositions and were not derived from other lost histories. The claim that the Anglo-Saxon King Athelstan granted a charter to the stonemasons to hold an assembly is chronologically impossible and the characteristic medieval fabrication. The legends in the Cook and Regius manuscripts were created by junior stonemasons 
in order to justify meetings to protest against contro controls over wages and prices imposed by legislation following labor shortages after the Black Death. It was not enough for these journeyman masons to claim that an Anglo-Saxon king had given them privileges. They invented a fabulous history claiming to show how kings and emperors have recognized the craft of masonry as special since the time of Noah. As the English government attempted to further control the wages of stonemasons and their right to meet, the stonemasons in return elaborated their legendary history, fabricating stories of further charters and privileges. The kind of process we see at work in the Cook and Regius manuscripts also occurs in many other medieval institutions ranging from guilds to monasteries. The myths and fabrications of the stonemasons' documents are particularly valuable for the insights they provide into the outlook and mentality of medieval artisans, as Lisa Cooper has shown in her book on artisans and narrative craft in later medieval England. Yet, oddly, they've rarely been studied from that point of view. The other remarkable feature of these medieval legends of the stonemasons is, of course, their persistence. Although we don't have any other extant manuscripts until the end of the 16th century, during the 17th and early 18th century, manuscripts of these medieval legends, known as the Old Charges, proliferate. This may partly be related to continued disputes about the wage level of masons. The levels of wages mentioned in the 16th, 17th century Old Charles manuscripts are manipulated in line with contemporary wage claims. The spread of Old Charles manuscripts is also probably related to major developments in the organization of Freemasonry in Scotland. The first surviving manuscript of the Old Charges after Cook and Regius, Grand Lodge Manuscript No. 1, is dated 25th of December 1583, a few days after the appointment of William Shaw as master of the king's work in Scotland. This requires further investigation, but it's unlikely to be a coincidence. It seems possible that Shaw began his work by seeking evidence of Masonic legends and that Grand Lodge manuscript number one may be the result of this. We cannot be completely certain of what happened, but there's no doubt that old charge manuscripts were in use in Scotland in the 17th and 18th centuries, and this illustrates how we should regard the process of the development of Freemasonry from medieval times as a complex and varied continuum. Much of the organizational structure of, of Freemasonry bears the impress of medieval guilds, such as quarterly meetings, the names of officers such as master and wardens, and the use of oaths. Another major element in the development of Freemasonry were the organizational reforms instituted by William Shaw in Scotland, succinctly summarized by David Stevenson as including the earliest use of the word lodge in the modern Masonic sense, the earliest lodge minute books, early exa earliest examples of non-operatives joining lodges, earliest evidence of the use of symbols to communicate ethical ideas, and earliest references to the Mason word. The way in which the discussion of the origins of Freemasonry has been distorted by Masonic anxieties about national precedence is evident from the fact that this 16th and 17th century Freemasonry in Scotland is consistently downplayed and disregarded, apparently out of concern that England's precedence may be undermined. Yet the people involved in the creation of the Grand Lodge in London knew they needed to find out about what was going on in Scotland. One of the first actions of Desagulier after the creation of Grand Lodge in 1721 was to visit the Lodge of Edinburgh, where, as David Stevenson observes, there is early evidence for the emergence of a third degree. Masonic scholars have generated an extraordinary number of theories about the origins of Freemasonry, which have been given imposing names like transitional, original birth, religious base, Rosicrucian, Enlightenment, Royal Society, and so on. The striking thing about all these theories 
is their difficulty in dealing with mixed and complex developments. They all assume linear lines of development, with key people or institutions portrayed as the originators of Freemasonry. But history does not work like this. It's complex and full of the kind of knots of interconnections that Mark Bloch described. We can see this in the way that William Shaw took medieval traditions and fused them with Renaissance ideas. The fascination of Freemasonry is in trying to trace these interconnections and not in seeking to promote one theory above another. Freemasonry is about transition, Rosicrucians, monasticism, enlightenment, and the Royal Society all together. The foundation of a Grand Lodge in London has been taken as a key watershed in Masonic history. And as my collaborator, Susan Mitchell Summers, explained at the last World Conference here in 2017, all the existing evidence suggests that the story of the foundation of the Grand Lodge by four lodges in London in 1717, first published by James Anderson in the 1738 Book of Constitutions, is unreliable. It contains many internal contradictions, and where we can trace sources of information that Anderson probably used, they are suspect. Other contemporary testimony, such as that of the antiquary William Stookley, contradicts Anderson. On the other hand, a contemporary minute in the possession of the Lodge of Antiquity in London states that the London Lodges gave up their powers in trust to a Grand Lodge comprising masters and wardens of the Lodges and under the direction of a Grand Master at a feast in Stationers Hall in London on the 24th of June 1721. Such a transfer of powers can only by definition happen once and given the lack of contemporary evidence for the existence of a Grand Lodge before 1721, Susan and I contend that the Grand Lodge in London was founded in 1721, not 1717. Now, it might seem that by insisting on the date of 1721 for the foundation of Grand Lodge, we are closing out evidence for the earlier development of Freemasonry, but this isn't the case. Rather, disposing of the shibboleth of 1717 makes it easier to accommodate evidence of earlier Freemasonry. This evidence is not only confined to Scotland. In York, non-working Masons were already being admitted to Stonemasons' lodges in the 17th century. There are hints of other organisations in Staffordshire and Cheshire. There are also suggestions of early Masonic activity in Ireland, and it's likely that Jacobite regiments and exiles had taken some Freemasonry with them from Scotland to the continent after 1688. Moreover, it's evident that the London Masons' lodges were organised before 1717 and conscious of their traditions. The lodge at the Goose and Gridiron jealously guarded manuscripts of the old charges, some associated with the London Masons Company. Some of these manuscripts include additional charges said to have been made at a General Assembly of Masons in 1663. And since this General Assembly is mentioned in multiple manuscripts, it may be that we've got more evidence for a General Assembly of Masons in 1663 than we have for the claim that there was one in 1717. In short, there are many landmarks in the history of Freemasonry, but no starting points. 1721, 1813, 1877, 1815, 1883 in Scotland, all these are important dates, but none of them represent the birth of Freemasonry. The creation of Grand Lodge in 1721 was driven by Whig nobles who saw in Freemasonry the potential for a powerful instrument to support the Hanoverian monarchy. Nevertheless, the appeal to the past and the invention of tradition had a prominent role. The prestige of the Goose and Gridiron Lodge was due to its custody of the oldest London copies of the legendary history of Freemasonry. The possession of these histories, these old manuscripts, was vital to Masonic 
authority and power. However, George Payne, the civil servant who marshaled the creation of the Grand Lodge on behalf of the Duke of Montague, managed to get custody of the Cook Manuscript, which he claimed was nearly 800 years old and embodied the ancient secrets of Freemasonry. It was the possession of the legendary history of the Cook Manuscript which gave Payne and his colleagues the authority to drive through the creation of Grand Lodge. This process, in turn, gave rise to another wholesale reinvention of history. Montague, Payne and others were convinced that the medieval monks who had transcribed the Cook manuscript had mangled the text. They felt that these monkish errors hid the true secrets of masonry and the ancient knowledge of the masons. James Anderson was commissioned to rescue these secrets by revising the medieval texts. Anderson produced a history of masonry and architecture freed from Gothic errors and kitted out in a new Palladian dress. But like the medieval charges, Anderson traced masonry back to the beginnings of time, declaring that there was no doubt that Adam taught his son's geometry. Anderson's work in reworking the legendary history into something appropriate for the age of Newton was contentious. The London publisher, James Roberts, complained that Anderson had made the constitutions unnecessarily lengthy at the expense and damage of the society and had printed them without authorization. Doubt was expressed as to whether Anderson's work had been properly sanctioned, and the first mo motion recorded in the new minute book of the Grand Lodge pointedly declared that it is not in the power of any man to make any alteration or innovation in the body of masonry without the consent first obtained of the annual Grand Lodge. The early Grand Lodge was keen to encourage this process of invention of the past. Grand Lodge was anxious to demonstrate that it was much older than its rivals. The Grand Lodge established in York in 1725 claimed to date back to the Anglo-Saxon Prince Edwin. The Jacobite Andrew Michael Ramsey made a celebrated speech which sketched out an alternative narrative of the origins of Freemasonry looking to the Templars and Crusades. This provided an alternative Jacobite and Tory uh, history narrative to counterway the Whig narrative of Anderson. In 1736, a Grand Lodge was also formed in Edinburgh, which looked back to Kilwinning and beyond. And that's, by that time, the Grand Lodge in London urgently needed to recapture the initiative in its claims to ancient status. It ordered James Anderson in preparing the revision of the Book of Constitutions published in 1738 to document the succession of Grand Masters back to the beginning of time. Anderson accordingly declared that the first Grand Master of Freemasons in England was St. Augustine, thereby trumping York, and that the very first Grand Master of Masons was Noah. In 1738, it was these earlier antecedents which were much more important to Anderson and the Grand Lodge in London than the story of 1717. They were much more worried about Noah than Sayer. Anderson never claimed that Grand Lodge was begun in 1717. He presents it as a revival. It was a story pieced together from various claims and tales current in the 1730s to fill a gap in those links back to Noah. When the new Book of Constitutions was published in 1738, little notice was taken of the story of 1717. Contemporaries were much more interested in the older fables. Lawrence Dermot, the Grand Secretary of the Ancients, mocked this custom of prefacing Masonic publications with a long and pleasing history of masonry from the creation. Dermot decided he would go one better he would write the history of masonry before the creation, including an account of that first Grand Lodge when Lucifer was expelled from heaven. Are such histories of any use in understanding the secret mysteries of the craft, Dermot wondered. 
The potency of historical narratives, invented or otherwise in Freemasonry, was apparent in William Preston's defense of the privileges of the Lodge of Antiquity, the successor of the Goose and Gridiron Lodge. Others continue to wonder what secrets lay behind Freemasonry. Indeed, it seems that the search from an Ur religion, something that preoccupied such 18th century figures as Anderson and Stokely, is a fundamental theme in the history of Freemasonry. At the end of the 18th century, writers like Thomas Paine used, early, used historical uh, narratives of Freemasonry to attack Christianity. Paine, following Bonneville, suggested that Christianity was a blasphemous perversion of the sun religion and that Freemasonry preserved the secrets of the primeval religion. The Yorkshire radical and social activist Godfrey Higgins became a Freemason in order to investigate these claims more deeply. With the backing of the Duke of Sussex, who was also deeply interested in the origins of religion, Higgins explored the records of the Grand Lodge in York and took away early copies of the old charges. In Anacalypsis, published posthumously in 1834, Higgins used these documents as evidence that Freemasonry embodied rituals of the ancient sun religion of which the Masons were the high priests. These esoteric views of the traditions of Freemasonry profoundly influenced the development of Freemasonry in the first half of the 19th century. One thread in the complex politics surrounding the Duke of Sussex's promotion of the union of the two Grand Lodges in England was his interest in reviving the ancient religion described by his associate Higgins. Perhaps even more influential was the reaction to Higgins' work by George Oliver, an associate of Robert Crucifix, who clashed with the Duke of Sussex as he campaigned to modernize Freemasonry with the publication of periodicals and the promotion of charitable campaigns such as a home for elderly Masons. George Oliver developed a Christian riposte to Higgins' work. Oliver accepted Higgins' assumptions about the antiquity of religion, but sought to show that early religions were part of God's purpose and paved the way for Christianity, the highest expression of religious belief. George Oliver agreed with Higgins that Freemasonry had existed from the earliest history of mankind, but he did not see Freemasonry as a remnant of an old religion. For Oliver, Freemasonry was the indispensable handmaid to the Christian religion and could only be fully appreciated by Christians. Oliver's views, in fact, echo those of James Anderson, who, as Susan Summers' recent researches has shown, was not so much a deist and was profoundly Trinitarian. Oliver did not claim that Freemasonry should be exclusively Christian, but argued that because Christianity was the highest form of ethics, the genius of Freemasonry could only be uh, uh, fully appreciated by Christians. George Oliver's teachings, constantly reiterated by Masonic chaplains and popularized by Masonic periodicals, such as the Freemason, had an enormous impact on British Victorian Freemasonry. Oliver invented historical materials on a vast scale to support his Christian view of Freemasonry. One of his most popular publications, The Revelations of a Square, which appeared in 1855, told the story of English Freemasonry from 1717 to 1813 through the voice of a square which had supposedly participated in key events. Although the narrative was told through a fictional mouthpiece, Oliver claimed that the facts were correct and based on a diary kept by his father, who he alleged had known Desagulier, Anderson, Preston and others. Oliver inserts many footnotes into his narrative, but most of these footnotes are to publications which do not exist. According to Oliver, Desagulier was entirely responsible for the events of 1717. He'd been initiated at the Goose and Gridiron and was encouraged by Christopher Wren to revive masonry and arrange the meetings which led to the formation of Grand Lodge. 
Oliver claims that Desaguliers and Anderson insisted that the ritual at this time should be explicitly Christian, complete invention. Oliver alleges that at that time, the Book of Common Prayer, according to the rites and ceremonies of the Church of England, was an established lodge book as it was considered to contain all the moral principles of the order. All, of course, a complete invention by Oliver. This is an important point in the development of the myth of 1717, which was a creation of the Victorian period. You will remember how Hobsbawm described the rise of nationalism and imperialism as the generator of inventive tradition, and George Oliver epitomizes this. He was keen to stress the Christian dimension to Freemasonry so that Freemasonry could provide social underpinnings to the British Empire. An endorsement to Revelations of a Square described how masonry was spreading in the East and across the world. Oliver was at the lead of this process. Wherever our principles have gone, thither also has passed the name of Dr. Oliver, the historian and the sage of masonry, and the contributions made in this offering to him from distant climes prove in some measure that his labors are not unrecognized. For George Oliver, 1717 was an act of Christian Freemasonry led by clergymen and an expression of English moral primacy. While Oliver saw the roots of Freemasonry reaching back millennia, for him it was England that brought the light of masonry to the modern world. The influence of clergymen like Oliver on English Freemasonry horrified those exiled French Freemasons who arrived in Britain after 1848 and after the coup of Louis Napoleon in 1851. They loudly criticized English Freemasonry through émigré publications like La Chaine de Union. Such criticisms encouraged a reaction against Oliver and earlier writers such as Preston among English Freemasons and the researchers associated with the creation of the Quattro Coronati Lodge in London, such as Robert Freak Gould, pioneered work on the history of Freemasonry using the latest antiquarian techniques of documentary criticism. In clearing away such historical detritus as Oliver's revelations of a square, Gould was confronted by many problems. If later works by people like Oliver and Preston were put to one side, the only narrative of 1717 was in Anderson's 1738 constitutions, compiled 20 years after the event by a man who wasn't involved in any of the events described. While some bits of Anderson are contemporary and may be regarded as a primary source, others are fanciful. Where do we draw the dividing line which marks the division between Anderson, the unreliable secondary source, and Anderson, the primary source. The best answer that one would probably give nowadays is the point at which Anderson was an eyewitness for the events described, which would be about 1722. However, Gould decided to draw the line earlier, at 1717, with fateful consequences. In a key discussion of the Four Old Lodges, published in 1879, Gould argues that Anderson is reliable as a source from about 1715, but completely discounts all the earlier sections of Anderson's work. The result is that in about 1879, 1717 emerges as the fundamental moment of Masonic history and the creation of Grand Lodge as the decisive act in the creation of free, modern Freemasonry. Gould describes the London Grand Lodge as the premier Grand Lodge of the world, which has become a wonder and pattern to the craft. Gould leaves his readers in no doubt of the primacy of the English Grand Lodge and its central role in the creation of modern Freemasonry. Now, you'll notice Gould was writing in 1879. He was writing shortly after the French Grand Orient had revised the first article of its constitution to remove references to the great architect of the universe. The Irish and Scottish Grand Lodges, and even Mother Kilwinning, quickly protested against this move, but the United Grand Lodge of England was anxious to demonstrate its claim to be the arbiter of regularity. 
It duly barred visitors from constitutions which did not require a belief in the great architect of the universe. This brought accusations that the English Grand Lodge was excommunicating other Freemasons. Gould's analysis of the events of he claimed took place in 1717 was clearly designed to provide an exhaustive analysis supporting the claims of the English Grand Lodge to be the premier Grand Lodge of the world. Gould's portrayal of 1717 as a pivotal moment in the history of Freemasonry was essential to maintain the prestige of the Grand Lodge and to provide it with the authority to excommunicate other Grand Lodges in France and elsewhere. Since the time of Gould, the conventional Anglophone view of Masonic history has been what can only be described as a Big Bang theory, with Freemasonry rapidly spreading across the world as the result of the creation of a Grand Lodge in London. Such a view, of course, again bolsters the self-image of the English Grand Lodge as the premier Grand Lodge of the world. Does such a Big Bang model fit our understanding of the growth of Freemasonry in the 18th century? From the point of view of Britain and its colonies, such a model underplays the vital role of Scottish and Irish Freemasonry, particularly through regimental knowledges, lodges. In thinking about British Freemasonry, we need to think much more about the interplay between these jurisdictions and less about which is the premier organisation. While English influence can be seen in the earliest lodge in the Netherlands, with two of the founding members having been initiated in England, it seems likely that the early development of Freemasonry there was also shaped by social and fraternal forms which had already arisen in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, such as the, the Chevalier de la Jubilation, described by Margaret Jacob. Likewise, in France, Freemasonry did not simply spread from England in a linear fashion, and we'll be hearing a lot to illustrate that over the next two days. The growth of Freemasonry meshed together various groups and practices, including both Jacobite and Hanoverian lodges, as well as many other forms of sociability. And what we need to do is to look less at single points of origin and more at interconnections and cross-fertilisation. Mark Bloch was a pioneer of transnational history. A major regret in preparing this lecture is that because of my own training and previous experience as primarily the historian of Britain, I haven't been able to open up here sufficient transnational perspectives. This is a pity because it becomes increasingly clear that in studying the history of Freemasonry, we need to break out of national silos. Freemasonry is a cosmopolitan and international phenomenon and needs to be studied in that way. Traditions are invented to bolster nationalism, and this is just as true in the history of Freemasonry as elsewhere. We will not break three of these national blinkers by drilling further and further down towards imagined hidden origins. We will only develop a rounded transnational view of Freemasonry by looking at the way that different stories are told and imagined about it and by seeing how these interconnect. Mark Bloch, uh, uh, one of the greatest French historians, urged us to look at the interconnectedness of human institutions and cultures. And seeking this interconnectedness is the ultimate key to Freemasonry. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, I'll take questions. Okay. Questions, please? Raise your hand. Oui, je voudrais simplement dire que l'exposé le, le, d'Andrew Prescott est extrêmement stimulant pour ceux qui s'intéressent euh, aux origines de la franc-maçonnerie et qui sont depuis une trentaine d'années pris en sandwich 
entre les partisans de la théorie de la transition et les partisans de la théorie de l'emprunt. Mais en fait, les uns et les autres sont d'accord sur un point, c'est que la franc-maçonnerie, c'est un phénomène bien identifié, constant, identique selon les lieux et selon les époques. En, en paléo-anthropologie, par exemple, on sait aujourd'hui que l'évolution de l'homme ne s'est pas produite comme ça, qu'il y a eu différents essais dont certains n'ont pas abouti, d'autres qui se sont rejoints. Et c'est quand on arrive à l'homo sapiens qu'on dit « Ah, c'est l'histoire de l'homme ». Alors ma question, c'est il faut, il faut peut-être euh, appliquer ce principe à l'historiographie maçonnique et renoncer, en tout cas avant le XVIIIe siècle, renoncer à dire qu'il y a la franc-maçonnerie. Il y a un phénomène qui parfois a porté plus ou moins ce nom, mais en réalité des gens qui n'étaient pas forcément informés de ce qu'ils qu existaient et qui n'avaient pas forcément de lien entre eux et qui surtout n'avaient pas forcément de lien de filiation entre eux. I think, I think that's a wonderful suggestion, Paul, uh, that we should think about Freemasonries or maybe even wider fraternalism and not have these boundaries that have occurred in the discussion of the subject in the past. Again, often because Freemasons have been very anxious to emphasize uh, the prestige of their own organization. And I could give you two examples of where I think we could be thinking about something that's kind of Freemasonries. One is uh, there's a, a fraternal order uh, in America and Britain uh, called the Order of the Good Templars. And uh, it's, it's uh, a, a abstinence order that it discourages its members from drinking. And uh, it's seen as separate, always presented as separate from Freemasonry and something, that, um, uh, something that's related more to friendly societies, which is considered a separate category. Yet, it began as simply a Templar order that decided not to drink. It was uh, not given recognition by Masonic authorities in England and sort of cast into the darkness. But its derivation is just as valuable as the other Templars' uh, uh, orders in England. So it's part of that Freemasonries and that need to look at a plural, uh, a, a multiply faceted uh, phenomenon. And we need to take more into account of that. The friendly societies like the Odd Fellows and not just see them as derivatives uh, of Freemasonry or poor imitations. The, the, there's been very little study of the rituals of, of fraternal orders uh, of, of friendly societies. And I think that's a rich further field for investigation. In the Home Office papers in London, Um, there are pre-1799 rituals of the Odd Fellows, which were suppressed in Britain at the time of the French Revolution, which are very rich rituals, um, and they deserve study by ritual specialists. So again, we, we need to have a much more multifaceted view and to look much wider. Uh, I think that's certainly my message, and I'm grateful to Paul for reiterating that. Hello. Bonjour. Juste, je parle un petit peu en non-historien et, et en non-anglophone. Je suis moins sévère euh, que l'orateur du jour sur, avec la notion de manipulation. Je vois ça d'un petit peu plus loin. Je vois la mise en place de la Grande Loge d'Angleterre plutôt comme s'inscrivant dans un contexte historique où où la guerre des deux roses, où la guerre des trois royaumes avait une importance et il fallait faire une unification. La notion de vérité telle qu'on l'envisage à l'époque moderne n'était pas la même que celle de l'époque. On considérait la vérité de l'époque comme la vérité telle qu'on la conçoit actuellement au XXIe siècle peut paraître un anachronisme. Donc je suis moins sévère et j'essaye de comprendre plutôt comme un comme s'inscrivant le système de la création ou de l'apparition d'une formation réunie en Angleterre, plutôt comme un processus d'unification. Mais peut-être que je me trompe parce que je ne suis pas historien et que je n'ai pas accès au texte. Je pense que ce qui est très intéressant, je pense, c'est que vous pouvez presque dire que, en effet, la formation Freemasonry is a, as much a creation of the 19th century as it is of the 18th century. Um, and the, 
the events that took place in the 1870s um, and the further developments, because the kind of Cold War uh, between the different blocks in Freemasonry didn't really set in until the 20th century. Um, and the origins of how that set up are very important. Uh, and I think regardless of whether one is, sees oneself as a historian or primarily trained in England or, or France, I think having that sense that Freemasonry is in a process of continual creation and change is very important. And that um, as much what we see in Freemasonry today is a creation of the 19th century as the 18th century. We, I think probably, I've always felt that maybe we stress the 18th century too strongly and that there's a lot more in thinking about the 19th century. In terms of the manipulation of things, um, I, to some extent, have tried to indicate that that is shot through Freemasonry like many other institutions. However, in thinking about the relationship between the English Grand Lodge and other Grand Lodges, particularly the Grand Orient of France, I think I might argue that it reflects a contradiction, a historical contradiction, was inherent in Freemasonry from a very early stage. That is, a cosmopolitan institution that emphasizes its loyalty to the civil power is always going to have a problem as those civil powers change because naturally a Grand Orient de France wants to reflect uh, the ethos of the civil power in France and that may be very different uh, to the nature of the state uh, in Victorian Britain. And how that works I think is, is fascinating in kind of breaking up um, the ice sheets uh, of Freemasonry in the 19th century. So again, it comes back to this business about it's not whether France or England were right or who's doing the wrong thing. It's actually seeing how um, the power politics is played out in those expressions as the institution comes along. So it's about thinking about the models of history which we have in our mind. I have a question, <laughs> a comment, it's right here. Um, when oh, you okay. were, We're yes, coming in there, yes. <laughs> uh, Professor Prescott, when you were, um, first of all, I appreciate what- um, Please, nobody call me Professor Prescott, it makes me very nervous, <laughs> okay. call me Andrew. And, <laughs> and uh, I do appreciate, when I am a, I study Freemasonry in Latin America, yep. and we actually prefer to call it Freemasonries. I think that's a great it's so, suggestion. Yeah. It's so difficult just to refer to, to one, but, when you were talking, I was thinking about the, the notion of in search of authenticity, that Masonic, uh, the Masonic tradition and Masonic scholars of the 19th century have like looked for how to approach the document, the documents, yeah. the archives, and um, the, the, the origins are like first thing that you need to look at it. And I think that in this search for, of, uh, for authenticity, is we have lost many of other cultural, uh, the impact yeah. that Freemasonry has. I was wondering uh, what is your take no, on I this? Think, I mean, the richness for me, to some extent, in thinking about the history of Freemasonry, one of the things that's very fascinating is that it's kind of almost a huge workshop for studying this process of the invention of tradition. Um, uh, you can see all these things being generated, and it's fascinating. And, Actually, that then uh, starts to get, give us a better view of the sorts of things that Hobsbawm and Aston were talking about in their book uh, at two levels. One is the sheer scale of it. I mean, when you look at what's going on with many Masonic institutions and the way new orders are being created, the richness of that invention of tradition is kind of, it's related to the development of nation states, but it's actually much culturally, much wider. And so there's something really to look at there. The other thing is that uh, it interests me as a medievalist, the, the interest in this process of invention of tradition has been mainly one uh, where modern historians have been interested and they've related it to the formation of the nation state. Um, and consequently, you get this idea that somehow in the pre-modern period, it was all purer. And it wasn't as Cook and Regis, they were actually better at it than we were later. Um, and so what's interesting is how newer traditions get fused onto older traditions. And that's 
not looking for a point of origin, it's looking for the way traditions work. And that's another very fascinating aspect of both Freemasonry and uh, uh, other uh, fraternal organizations. So uh, I, I, I like the idea of Freemasonry and all Freemasonry provide us with this very rich laboratory for exploring this idea of the invention of tradition. Any other questions, comments, Pierre? <coughs> oui, dans la, dans la <coughs> communication d'Andrew, il y a bien sûr des tas de pistes très stimulantes. Alors, moi, il y a une chose qui m'interpelle et qui me paraît très intéressante, c'est notamment en Europe, quand on oppose les maçonneries anglaises et françaises, et notamment la Grande Loge Unie d'Angleterre et le Grand Orient de France à la fin du 19e siècle, on les regarde et on se dit, c'est très différent, ils, ils ont une franc-maçonnerie très différente, mais en fait, leur fonction sociale est exactement la même. C'est-à-dire qu'en Angleterre, eh bien, on, on promeut les valeurs et on soutient le système politique victorien de la fin du Xe siècle. Et en France, on promeut les valeurs et on soutient le système politique de la Troisième République. Donc, euh, elles ont l'air comme ça très différentes, mais leur fonction sociale est exactement la même. Et ça, c'est naturellement une perspective un peu, euh, un peu euh, nouvelle et qui est très, qui est très stimulante. Et alors, sinon, sur le, le problème des origines, parce que euh, après la communication d'Andrew, nous sommes pleins de bonnes résolutions. Nous ne travaillerons plus sur l'origine première de la franc-maçonnerie, mais quand même, quand même, le naturel va revenir et on va quand même s'y intéresser un peu. Et finalement, ce que je crois, c'est que cette idée de dire il y a plusieurs pôles, il y a plusieurs points, et il faut les étudier, mais en coupant ce que nous avons en tête, c'est-à-dire jusqu'à présent, ça a été étudié par rapport à la création de 1717 et par rapport à, à ce qui se passe à partir de 1717. Et en fait, toutes ces choses curieuses qu'on a du mal à, à saisir, par exemple ce qui se passe à York au XVIIe siècle, euh, je me souviens avoir fait un article sur un ex-libriste extrêmement curieux qui date de 1663, si je me souviens bien, où le, le possesseur de l'ex-libriste dit euh, Robert euh, Turk, euh, Freemasons. Ça veut dire quoi à York en 1663 ben, alors En plus, il est architecte. Et donc, en fait, il faut étudier ces différents, euh, ces différents points maçonniques euh, en eux-mêmes. Et puis peut-être qu'après, on pourra créer des réseaux et, et voir comment les uns influencent sur les autres. Euh, et notamment, une, une, une question que, que, que je trouve tout à fait intéressante, alors c'est plus une, une question d'historien maçonnique britannique, mais et une question difficile, c'est quand la Grande Loge se crée en, 1727, en 1717 ou en 1721 il y a des, des, des groupes qui résistent un peu, qui disent que ce n'est pas la vraie franc-maçonnerie, il y a les constitutions de Robert, etc. Et ces gens-là sont probablement des vestiges de certains de ces groupes qui existaient et qui n'ont pas été pris dans le processus. Et donc, mon sentiment, c'est qu'on on en saura plus sur le, le, le processus de création de cette franc-maçonnerie moderne bah, qui nous a créé, nous, par exemple, la maçonnerie continentale, en, en étudiant chacun de ces points comme un tout en soi et, et pas avec en tête... Quel rôle ils ont joué dans la création de la franc-maçonnerie euh, Et puis ensuite, dans un second temps, bah, peut-être qu'on aura plus de lumière, justement, sur comment les pièces du Pulse se, se sont disposées. Um, the first point you made, I was, as, you, as most of you probably know, I'm not a Freemason. And when I first started working in the centre at Sheffield, uh, my colleagues, my Masonic friends at Sheffield, used to mutter about, well, we don't want to be involved with French Freemasonry because they spend all their time talking about politics and religion. Um, and then when we used to have the conferences at Canonbury, which was great because we had people from all uh, different Masonic orders, including Pierre himself, of course, what would happen, what happens when you get Freemasons in a room? They don't want to talk about politics and religion. They want to talk about ritual details, about jewels, <laughs> and it's all the same conversation, whatever part. So that's right. I mean, it, it is that. Um, what's interesting for me in terms of that issue about what's going on in London around about the time of the formation of the Grand Lodge is that I think there are a number of um, uh, uh, power movements that we haven't quite pulled out yet. I hinted at some of those if you heard, if anyone heard my paper in the Bordeaux conference last week um, uh, with the Duke of Wharton. Um, I think it's something along the lines of First of all, something happens within the, the Mason's Lodge in London that causes the uh, people associated with the exception to get moved out in some way. Um, and that then uh, Montague and Payne take an interest in creating 
uh, a new form of Freemasonry, a Grand Lodge of Freemasonry, as a court activity in support of the Hanoverian monarchy. Um, and the, that's, everyone's happy about that, but then when the Grand Lodge starts to use its power to develop the book, new Book of Constitutions, there are issues which Wharton and others exploit um, because that contradicts the historic traditions um, that the Lodge in the Goose and Gridiron uh, uh, have preserved. And there are constant tensions, class tensions in the early Grand Lodge uh, between the aristocratic members and those members who are seeking charity, like Sayer himself. Um, these are all, we've only got hints of these, these are all fascinating areas. Um, but these are all further areas for, for research in this area. Susan and I, this is kind of part of a book that Susan and I are working on, and we hope that that will explore these more fully. Justin, finishing this, and in support of what Andrew has said, the Order of the Eastern Star, which is, of course is a uh, Masonic organization with both men and women, when it was started, the founders claimed it had been originated by Queen Christina of Sweden. Uh, they uh, then thought better of it and uh, dropped her. Uh, they also started with um, uh, Greek mythological figures and uh, came in for some criticism from uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians. So they changed the Greek... Uh, uh, goddesses into uh, biblical uh, figures like Ruth. Um, in African American Freemasonry, which uh, uh, of course exists here in France and, and throughout the world because they have military lodges, uh, they emphasize Egypt and their periodicals are full of the Egyptian origins of Freemasonry. In the case of the Shrine, which is another Masonic organization. Uh, the Shriners, uh, for a long time, uh, claimed that uh, they had gone uh, to uh, the uh, African uh, Sahara and had been initiated uh, in Aleppo and other places, uh, uh, making a, a sort of caravan to acquire the knowledge which became the Shrine. <laughs> that became an embarrassment, and uh, they dropped that. So uh, I, it seems incontrovertible that what Andrew has told us today uh, is a huge mine of these inventions, and some of them very recent, so that you can uh, document them very thoroughly. Uh, I, I want to give profound gratitude to what Andrew gave to us today uh, as a way to make a new way forward uh, and to create, I hope, a healthy suspicion about the story we have been telling uh, and uh, maybe it needs revision. Um, we can now adjourn for coffee, but please respect the times because everybody has their paper and they deserve the time to deliver it. So let's have coffee and you might have a chance to talk to Andrew himself.
Yeah, 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 yeah. 